Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey here at Brock University, and welcome to our second installment of the 2024 Covey Lecture Series. Our speaker today is my colleague and, and buddy, Dr. Gary Pickering. We started here at Brock, uh, um, fairly close to each other. Uh, Gary is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and in psychology at Brock University. He's a researcher affiliated with Covey, and he's also a founding member of Brock's Environmental Sustainability Research Center. Uh, Gary is a stellar scientist. He's published over 200 peer-reviewed papers, conference proceedings, books, and is affiliated with numer numerous national and international research institutes. And this includes Charles Sturt University and the University of the Sunshine Coast, which are both located in Australia. Uh, his main research interests are primarily concerned with flavor science, enology, and the psychophysics of taste, and more recent projects have focused on the sustainability of viticulture and winemaking and its impact on consumer behavior. And I believe that's what his presentation is going to focus in on uh, today. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Pickering for today's lecture. Thank you, Debbie, for those kind words. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you today. And I hope it will be a chat and interactive, and we'll have uh, time at the end for, uh, for a discussion around, uh, around my slides. So sustainability is, uh, is the theme, and uh, what I wanted to present was the, the results from a, a very preliminary trial that we completed uh, last year, which hopefully will be the start of a larger program uh, funding permitting. Of course, profs don't do the work, it's always the students that do the hard work, so it's important to acknowledge them up front, in particular Maria Best. So most of what I'm talking about today is from um, Maria Best's Honours Project. Uh, she completed her Honours Project here um, in Knowledge and Viticulture uh, last year. Also Shannon Ruskers, who uh, completed her Masters in Sustainability Science here at Brock, also last year, uh, made some contributions. And uh, our friend uh, Belinda Kemp uh, was on Maria's um, supervisory committee and uh, has made some very helpful technical additions. So thanks to everyone. Why are we talking about sustainable wines? What's the interest? Well, first of all, whether or not we like it or not, wine is not an inherently sustainable product. It's an, and for a really good review, um, Biano, uh, two years ago, three years ago now, published a, a great document in sustainability, which I have, have if you wanted to follow up some of these, um, these items in more detail. But to summarise some of the, the, the key points from her review, very high water demands, even within the context of other agricultural uh, products. Similarly to other horticultural and agricultural products, there's a high chemical load often on the environment from fertilizers, from pesticides, um, fungicides, and so on. These things result in reduced biodiversity, they, reduce, they result in um, soil infertility in many instances, and they do contribute to pollution in terms of our uh, waterways, our lakes, rivers, and so on. Energy demands are high. Uh, particularly in the winery, and in the case of uh, fossil fuel, the um, case of fuel source, the significant greenhouse gas emissions from wine growing, wine making. Not huge in the context of other agri food products, but still present. And I think our interest in sustainable wines has, has been um, renewed in the last several weeks. So, one, one of, if not the major out from the COP28 climate conference in uh, November last year was um, their declaration to make agri-food sustainability the priority in, in the next several years, in recognition of its large contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. And so work on, on grapes and wine, I think, falls really well within that, uh, that mandate. In terms of the relative contributions of what we do with grape growing, not to do with winemaking, most of the greenhouse gas emissions in fact come post-harvest. 
run about 80% uh, from the winery uh, and distribution phases. And of that, a large portion of that is in fact from um, our uh, use of glass, uh, glass bottles and the transportation, uh, the, the energy cost involved in the production, but particularly involved in the transportation. We contribute waste, significant waste, and often um, much less visible is the social injustices uh, in terms of sustainable or insustainable wines. A good example was uh, October, November, again last year. A lot of media coverage on um, alleged human rights uh, abuses uh, within the champagne industry uh, in terms of um, illegal migrant and uh, the treatment of, uh, vineyard, of migrant vineyard workers. To my knowledge, there's two court cases currently working their way through the system. So there are the, there's the social sustainability side of winemaking that we need to address as well. Consumers are changing and changing rapidly. So particularly with younger demographics, but also with some older uh, cohorts, sustainability is featuring more and more as one of the cues that consumers are using when it comes to purchase behaviour. What product category um, will I, will I um, adopt and what product within those categories will I purchase? So in a way we have not seen before, the sustainability of consumer goods uh, is becoming an important driver uh, for purchase behaviour in general. We know much less about wine, but we do for other consumer products. And from a top-down approach, I mean, most industry leaders and practitioners want to do things better, greener and more sustainably, um, and also want to be able to meet this growing consumer demand for sustainable products. So that's the big framing of why we might be interested in sustainable wine production. What on earth is sustainable wine? So as many definitions as there are technical reports out there, frankly. The FAO in the United Nations is probably the, the definition that uh, uh, is one of the more well, well known. And as it relates to wine, it's very well presented in this graphic from, um, from BC, from Sustainable Wine Growing BC. Now, simply acknowledges or shows that it's not just environmental factors or dimensions that define a sustainable wine. For it to be truly sustainable, it has to incorporate economic and social measures and dimensions. And that's something that's, that's probably missing. So we'll use that definition in terms of how we look at uh, sustainable wine in this study and in this presentation. Now, in recent years, we've seen lots of initiatives uh, at industry uh, and institutional level to try and get a handle on what sustainable wine means and how we can uh, practice more sustainably. Uh, so with OIV recently, and I think very belatedly, but recently has incorporated sustainability principles uh, into uh, their protocols and recommendations and their, um, their policy plans for the, for the next several decades. Uh, a much newer organisation based in the UK, Sustainable Wine Roundtable, um, in the last couple of years are working very hard with industry globally to try and develop um, a package of resources but also a framework um, as well as potentially a certification system which will recognise all three dimensions of sustainability and give people practitioners um, more of a guide, more of a structure rather than this nebulous term, term sustainable and much closer to home. Now, for several years now, Sustainable Wine Growing Ontario and its um, counterpart in BC now, have had sustainable certification programs um, and which are audited and are also developing resources for, for industry to help them become more sustainable. So overlaid, often, often neglected in, in these initiatives, is the sort of more basic question of well, what about consumers? They're the ones in the end who are uh, making decisions on how, what they will or will not buy or drink. What are their perceptions of a sustainable wine? What are the barriers to them adopting more sustainable wine uh, in their behaviours? And, uh, and what opportunities are there for us uh, in industry? 
So those, um, those simple questions really guided this study. And again, I have to emphasize, it's just a pilot preliminary study um, that was going after these four questions. So for Canadian consumers, what are their current perceptions and understanding of sustainable wines? What is the knowledge base? How much do they know? How much do they want to know? Is sustainability even important to them? We know it's only a motivator for purchase decisions with other consumer products, everything from fashion through to food. Maybe it's not important uh, for wine consumers. And if it is, what are the characteristics of those who are most engaged with sustainable wine? If we know that, that can help with segmenting the marketplace, it can help with marketing, advertising, promotional initiatives. Currently, what are consumers doing around sustainable wine? Are they buying them? If so, how much? And what proportion of their total wine intake could be considered sustainable wine? What are the factors that predict that engagement? And we know, for instance, the social demographic characteristics of, uh, of people that are perhaps not engaged in sustainable wine. Um, that provides excellent information for industry in terms of trying to move them through into making uh, more sustainable wine purchases. And uh, part of that question is what is the potential uh, in terms of moving the dial, in terms of getting consumers more engaged with these products that are buying more? Have we saturated the market already? Is there potential for growth? What is that potential? And we can't get much more than a surface understanding from a 10 minute survey, which is what this uh, research is based on, but we can at least get a sense of uh, where the answers might lie to these questions. So in terms of the, the general design of the study, it was, as I've said, just like a 10 minute survey. Uh, it was conducted in 2022. Um, we used Dilata, uh, an mar online marketing um, company, to uh, provide us access to uh, Canadian wine consumers. Uh, an ultimate sample, um, we used 725 of the responses. We targeted and got a representative um, sample in terms of gender from across the country. In terms of provincial representation that matches the, the, the census in terms of uh, household income. Our particular sample is slightly more educated than the average Canadian um, uh, adult and our age uh, is slightly higher, 42.3 I think is the average Canadian age for adults, uh, ours was 47. So we can be confident, somewhat confident that our results probably do apply and can be extrapolated uh, to, to all Canadian wine consumers. So that first question, what are current perceptions and understandings around sustainable wine? Here's what we did. So first of all, we um, scanned the literature and pulled out um, cues or motivators for purchase that we know apply to, to, to wines in general from dozens of studies. You know, things like price and quality and value and quality and so on. And we also added some, some sustainability cues um, and had consumers rate the relative importance of this list of purchase motivators or cues. So we can see where, if at all, sustainability uh, features relative to other uh, cues. We then asked consumers, we gave them an open response question, so no prompting, no, no cues, no primary, just simply, what do you understand um, of a sustainable wine? What does it mean to you? So they used free form to, to complete that question. Uh, and then we applied, we used uh, standard inductive coding techniques to try and derive uh, and quantify the, the main themes that came out of that analysis. We then prompted them uh, with characteristics of sustainable wines that we knew from the literature applied to other countries uh, to see how relevant they were uh, to, to Canadian wine consumers. And so that was simply a check and apply question. You know, of these following 24 items, which, which do you think uh, uh, are characteristic of sustainable ones? And so those uh, items covered cover several categories, price, quality, ingredients, health, environmental dimensions. 
And again, we're curious as to what um, the characteristics were of those who were most involved with sustainable wine. Uh, so we measured sustainable wine involvement and also general wine involvement, which is basically the average score across their interest in the product, their knowledge of the product, uh, and how much they how, much, how often they purchase the product. It was an average score we can measure involvement that way. Okay, so what we find for that first question. So what we have here for all consumers um, is the average ratings on an importance scale. How important are the following factors when you make a purchase uh, decision? From not important at all through to extremely important. All we can see is the top three there. Quality, taste, expect, and probably again, quality, taste, expectation, and price were the dominant motivators or self-reported motivators for why they buy a particular wine uh, over another. Nothing particularly surprising there. We've seen that with other Canadian studies we've conducted. Often price is, is, is higher than what it was for this cohort, but that, that's pretty standard, um, not just in Canada, but um, throughout wine drinking regions. This is a little bit surprising that sweetness rating uh, was uh, somewhere between important and very important for this cohort. However, the three cues that signal sustainability certified sustainable, certified organic, and certified biodynamic were amongst the lowest in terms of the ratings of consumers, in terms of how important these, these are. They still, um, they still have some importance. These scores all fall between um, somewhat important and important, but relative to other cues, they, they are much lower. So that's interesting. Ugly slide, followed by several other ugly slides, but I'll try and uh, walk us all through it. So that second question was open response. What does a sustainable wine mean to you? Thematic analysis after inductive coding, yada yada, to pull out the dominant, uh, the dominant themes. Again, important to stress, there's no prompting at all. It, um, respondents had no prior information, so as we wouldn't bias them. And these are listed in the, uh, from the most prevalent themes cited down to the least prevalent themes cited. Right, so up, up top, first and foremost, uh, and probably of no surprise, environmental related themes were the dominant ones cited by consumers. Sustainable wine is most related to environmental themes. So simple statements like one that doesn't impact the environment uh, would be a typical uh, response received. Second most prominent theme, dunno. Literally, dumbo was a common answer. Um, I have no idea. Anything, any response that reflected that uh, that idea uh, was coded as no understanding. That's interesting. And straight away, you know, one can look at some managerial implications of this of this lack of knowledge. Uh, next, most common response was sustainable production. So. It's not particularly helpful simply if someone referenced the word sustainable in their, in their, in their answer and it got dumped in here. Typically there was no further information provided so it doesn't provide much in the way of extra insights other than it was related to production uh, of the wine as opposed to, let's say, um, uh, transport. And before we start to get a big drop off in citation frequencies, we, this theme of reduce, renew, and recycle was the next most uh, prevalent theme. When we reflect on that, it's perhaps not surprising. So, both in terms of the general media, but also community based initiatives like you know, the Green Bin program and, and so on, we're pretty much exposed to this idea when we think about sustainability of, of reduce, renew, and recycle. So to see it reflected in the wine consumers' perceptions of sustainable wines is perhaps not, not surprising. So remember, remember that the UN definition or most definitions of sustainability incorporate social and economic dimensions. Well, 
these were cited by respondents, but very low um, frequency. They're just not that salient for Canadian wine consumers when they're thinking about sustainable wine, they're thinking about environmental aspects of sustainability. At least that's what the results show so far. So remember we then gave consumers a list of um, 25, I think, items that were characteristic of sustainable wine and, and research that's been conducted elsewhere. Uh, and ask them to simply uh, tick, tick if they agree that this is, uh, this is important. And then we, we group these after the fact into, into categories. Uh, the respondents didn't see this information. Makes it somewhat easier to, uh, uh, to make sense of it. So let's dive into those four, four figures. First of all, the environmental considerations were cited much more frequently than anything else, uh, reinforcing what we saw in that open response um, question. So sustainable wines help protect the environment. They're packaged in environmentally friendly ways. They reduce greenhouse gas emissions with the, with the dominant um, uh, attitudes uh, reflected. Now most wine in Canada is packaged in glass bottles, which I tell you is not particularly environmentally friendly for a whole bunch of reasons. But because for other bottles, Bottled, uh, bottles, they can be uh, recycled. Uh, perhaps that's a, um, an, er an erroneous perception from consumers. Because uh, glass is not, at least the way we currently use glass in the industry, particularly uh, sustainable. Interesting that um, the number of people that cited um, sustainable wine is organic or it is biodynamic is quite low. It's just over 30% for organic and uh, about 14% for biodynamic. What does that mean? Well, it means that sustainable wine is not synonymous with being organic or being biodynamic for wine consumers. In fact, there's quite a distinction there in that those citation rates. People are thinking about sustainable wine differently or conceptualising it as, as being something a different beast than an organic wine or a biodynamic wine. In terms of economic and social uh, considerations, uh, again, as we saw with the open response question, these dimensions are, are not as frequently endorsed or incited as environmental. Uh, but over a third of consumers think that an environment, think that a sustainable wine has been made by a more responsible uh, winemaker, um, uh, and that it has, uh, and the production has a respect for ethical issues, so that they are being acknowledged. And also, they believe that uh, a sustainable wine reduces transportation and packaging costs. That's reflecting an, e an awareness of an economic dimension uh, of sustainable wines. And lastly, ingredient and personal health considerations. Uh, again, not a lot of endorsement um, for, uh, uh, for these characteristics. Uh, but over a third of respondents uh, think that a sustainable wine uh, is transparent about the origins of raw material uh, that are used to make that, uh, that wine. So some of, this, some of these results agree with consumers in other countries, um, other, others do not. And this is one slide in which the ingredient and personal health side uh, is often um, a lot more important to you with European consumers. Oh, tell a lie, this is the last one. So, price, taste, and quality considerations essentially not, not very salient uh, for consumers. They're not cited these um, very often. But that's interesting, just think back to the very first slide three most dominant purchase motivators for wine in general, by a big margin, are price, taste and quality. And yet when consumers are reflecting on sustainable wine, price, taste and quality are not featuring high in their definition or understanding of a sustainable wine. I think the good news there is that this is the marketing potential in terms of promotion and positioning of sustainable wines. 
Currently, they're rated low when people think about sustainable wines, but we know in general these are very dominant motivators. So I think there's some targets there for, uh, for wine marketers. Okay, so we're interested in, in, in uh, understanding well, what are the characteristics of those who are just not into low, uh, not into sustainable wine versus those who are, um, uh, are very much into the wine. So we just took a fine label, which we probably didn't. I tell a lie, I'm sure we did now. But we did characterise people into being low or, or high um, uh, indulgence in sustainable wine and tried to see if there was any segmentation possibilities there in terms of their characteristics. So here, so again, this, uh, this, the sustainability, the, the wine involvement measure is the average score for your interest in the product, your self-rated knowledge of the product, and how frequently you purchase the product. And uh, the significance here, it's got an asterisk, it means that particular um, attribute or factor uh, did differentiate, it did differ between low and high involved consumers. So, first, first of all, no gender or no um, provincial differences. The provincial result may or may not be surprising, and the gender one is, it does contrast with what um, uh, many European studies have found. Everything else being equal, girls are much better than boys when it comes to anything to do with green behaviour, uh, pro-environmental uh, actions and intentions and purchase behaviour. It's one of the truisms in sustainability science. Do not see evidence of that in this, uh, this cohort. Uh, women, um, males and females were, uh, were equally likely to be high and low uh, um, uh, engages with sustainable wines. We've got some other data that reinforces this finding. So that's interesting. If nothing else, there's not much point in, 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 in promoting or marketing uh, the product based on, on gender differences or what sort of magazines one gender might read, for instance. Uh, you're not going to get the, uh, much bang for your buck out of that. There was an age result such that. Those who are uh, more highly involved in sustainable wines were older. I'm sorry, were younger than low involvement. That's consistent with what um, uh, many other wine regions have found, and it's consistent with um, the greater the greater engagement with sustainability, the greater valuing of that um, uh, with other consumer products. There's a but, but there's a but here. We'll look at the button in a minute. So this is just simply self-reported behaviour. How much, how, how, in, uh, how, how, how are you into uh, sustainable wines? Uh, what are your attitudes towards them? What, what's your knowledge base? These are subjective judgments. There was an education effect uh, such that you're more likely to be a low involvement consumer if your highest attainment was high score or less. There was no household income effect, which I think several people were surprised by that result. But income does not predict whether or not you're more or less likely to be a high involved um, uh, consumer. As we'd expected, we did see a general wine involvement effect. So essentially, the more you're into wine in general, both in terms of your interest uh, and your knowledge and how much you drink, the more likely you'll be into sustainable wine. And that's reflected in other things that um, associate with wine involvement, like you know, how frequently you purchase uh, uh, wine, how much you spend on wine, and it's higher for those that are into sustainable wine. None of this is really that surprising, uh, but it's, uh, from a uh, price point uh, perspective, it's, good. it's interesting to know that these folks are willing to or do report paying you know, more than five bucks a bottle extra for, uh, uh, for wine. How does that relate to, and the sustainable wine result is just what we would expect. By definition, if you're more highly involved in sustainable wine, you're going to buy it <laughs> more, more frequently. But I think what's, um, what's interesting is these last two um, results, is that uh, those who are more highly in, involved in wine will also pay more for sustainable wine, around about five bucks more. But what's interesting is the premium is no higher. That is the percentage or the amount above and beyond what you would pay for a 
a, a general wine is no different between the two, two cohorts. There's no more premium uh, in targeting the high involvement or, or the low involvement group. Proportionally, there's no difference in what they will pay for, for the product. So there's some, there's some preliminary stuff in there that I think uh, helps to inform um, you know, questions around price point, which I know is one of the big issues that industry is struggling with. Not just making a sustainable wine more affordable, but also um, what the market sensitivity, what the optimum pricing is from a consumer perspective right, around the products. Right, so the next question, um, no, I'm sorry, we'll finish with this question. We, we looked at the importance of purchase cues or purchase motivators to see if they would differ as a function of how much you are into sustainable uh, wine. So the red bars are those that uh, have high involvement and the blue bars are those that have low involvement. What you can see, with one exception, for any purchase cue or motivator, um, highly involved uh, consumers uh, rate that cue as being more important. Maybe not that surprising, um, but there are some relative differences that I think are important. Um, quality indicators. So all these measures here, like um, quality is really important to me when I buy a wine, quality scores, the awards on a, a label, the quality statements on a label, proportionally they are actually um, more important for high sustainable wine um, consumers. Uh, and we'll speak to more, more about that shortly. So I think that's an interesting point of differentiation. Uh, and price is the one thing that was not different. So both high and low sustainable wine consumers value the price equally, even though one's paying more than the other. Okay, so the, the next question was, well, where are people at now in terms of their engagement with sustainable wine? Uh, we took eight measures from the literature, eight different sorts of behaviours. Um, most research, including Canadian research to date, is almost exclusively focused on organic wine. You know, it's simply um, polling consumers about their organic wine perceptions and simply how much, how likely are they to purchase the product and how much, how likely they are to pay extra for the product. We went beyond that and asked about eight different sustainable wine uh, behaviours. The response options, and I'll explain these short, uh, more shortly, were these. So folks for each of those eight behaviours uh, were, uh, were um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking here myself. Here's an, here's an example of the eight sustainable wine behaviours. When there's a choice, I choose the wine that impacts the environment the least. I avoid buying wines from companies that I know do not respect working conditions and so on. That's, that's the eight um, questions. The response options, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, were these. You either tick a box that says, I'm not doing this, I'm not willing to, I would like to do this, but don't know how, I would like to do this, and I already know how, and I'm already doing this. They're pulled from um, uh, a theory called the Travis Theoretical Model, which I'll very briefly uh, talk about in the next slide, and we also measured wine involvement uh, as, uh, as described previously. So, only theory slide I'll present today, I, I, I promise. Um, rather than just asking simple questions like, well, I'm doing this, or I'm not doing this, okay? The trans theoretical model um, suggests that human behaviour and decision making is much more compl complex than that. And it, it positions that within a, a change cycle. This originally came from the health, um, health field, where researchers were looking at um, uh, behaviours such as um, stopping smoking or reducing my weight, I would, uh, changing my eating behaviour to reduce uh, obesity. But we've been using it the last several years looking at um, uh, pro-environmental behaviours and I think it's really valuable. Essentially the idea is that, well, um, there's a loose cycle that goes like this. There's a behaviour that we're not going to engage in. It might simply be we're not aware that that is a behavioural choice, or it might be we have attitudinal barriers. That's the silly thing to do, I'm never going to do that. Whatever, that's called pre-contemplation. The next step or stage is called contemplation. For whatever reason, the consumer has changed their thinking to, yes, I want to engage with that behaviour. 
but I've got no idea how I do that, where I start. The preparation stage is um, the idea that, yes, I want to do this behaviour and I know what to do. Action stage, I'm doing it. As with many human behaviours, there's often a maintenance stage in which we're asking ourselves questions about do I continue doing this behaviour or not? If I don't, uh, then the cycle can kick back in again. And we can enter and we do enter or exit that cycle at any stage. Now why it's interesting, apart from the fact that I think it better represents the complexities of, of human behaviour, is that depending upon what stage you are at as an individual or where a population is at, there's different interventions that make better sense to try and move you through to the next stage. This stage here might simply be um, educational campaigns focused on just making folks aware, aware that there's this alternative behaviour. We're in the contemplation stage, you're already saying, yeah, I want to do it, but no idea how. So again, if we stick with education as the example, it's more context-specific information you need to tell people. I think a good example, a silly example might be, okay, I'm now committed to buying an electric car. So information in terms of local dealerships, in terms of um, uh, where the recharge facilities are and, and mileage and all that sort of stuff helps figure out, helps to move them from the contemplation stage into the preparation stage. Preparation stage, um, yep, I'm there, I want to do it, I know how, but you're still not doing it. So interventions called nudging uh, are often the best type to move them through to the action stage. Anyway, I think it's interesting from that perspective, from a marketing, from a social engineering perspective, if we know where a population or a demographic is within the cycle. And it hasn't been applied to, uh, to wine before. Or pet it right, where are we? Sorry, I've actually lost my place. Oh, yeah. There we are. Good stuff. Okay, so this is the, um, the proportional response for all eight behaviours. So these are the eight stable wine behaviours. This is the proportion for each behaviour who are in the different stages. You know, red, no, I'm not going to do it. All the way through to green, I'm already doing this. Really important slide. What can we see? Well, we can see that the, the, the colour that is most prevalent is orange. So the most common response for any of these eight behaviours is, I would like to do this, but I don't know where to start. Otherwise, there's a huge educational opportunity and challenge for us if we want to promote sustainable wine. Related to that, you combine the orange and yellow bars together, by far and away, that's the most predominant response. These are called the change stages. People aren't stuck in pre-contemplation, they're not uh, currently doing the behaviour, they're in a change stage. That's really exciting news, I think, when it comes to the capacity um, the potential sustainable wine spirit in, in Canada. In terms of action stage, um, most are not engaged in, in currently with these products, the exception being um, where possible I buy wines packaged and reusable or recycling containers. It's a bit of a red herring because here in Canada, I mean, glass bottles are about the only thing, more or less, um, uh, that wines are, are packaged in. So, um, I wouldn't put too much uh, weight on that. In terms of the red, uh, red response, uh, I'm not doing this and there's no way in hell I'm going to, we can see the most um, prevalent is for these two behaviours here. I pay more for socially responsible wine when there's an alternative. I pay more for environmentally friendly wine, uh, even when there's a cheaper alternative. So, that's telling us this, that consumers, or at least, at least a segment of consumers, are particularly price sensitive when it comes to sustainable wine, which probably won't be a surprise to, to uh, current producers. At least we have some data now to, uh, uh, to back that up. Right, so what factors predict uh, engagement? Uh, to answer this question, we used um, the same questions that have already been determined from, from the previous, uh, previous slides. We did an initial uh, correlation analysis. 
to help decide what factors to include in a, a fancy regression model uh, later on. And we kept out several factors because they were not related to the likelihood of you being in an action stage or in an inaction stage. And some of these were surprising. So again, gender made no difference. Um, whether or not you are not performing the behaviour or you're intending to, gender was not a predictor. Nor was province, nor was education, nor was household income, nor was the importance of price. These things were not related to your action stage. The other stuff was so that was used in a regression uh, model. Um, and the cool thing about the regression model that we use is that you can determine, first of all, regression allows you to determine the effect of one factor while counting for others. So we could account, for instance, well, not in this example, but um, we know that um, there's almost always a gender differences, except in this study. Um, so we can determine the, the importance or the relevance of your gender, um, also accounting for, let's say, income differences at the same time, because typically women earn less than, than, than males. So that's the advantage of doing a, doing a, uh, a regression analysis. The second advantage uh, in the model that we use is that in the same analysis, you can simultaneously determine what drives action and what drives inaction. So when you think about it, those things that motivate me to do something could be different to those, motive, those factors that motivate me not to do something. And so you can simultaneously work out what factors are driving both of those, um, those action stages or, or inaction stages. So, I know this is horrible and I'll try and break it down. First of all, these are the eight behaviours again. The A stands for action, the PC stands for pre-contemplation. That's basically, it. I'm not going to do it. These are the things that were predictive, and so those are the factors that we looked at more closely. Uh, uh, an asterisk means that that was a, a strong predictor for that particular behaviour. If it's positive, it means it had a positive effect. If it's negative, it means it had a negative effect. That's the, uh, the beta values. So let's break it down a little bit more. Can. or rather I'll simplify things, of all the things we looked at, and again we've dropped off a whole bunch of demographic variables because they weren't important, perhaps not surprisingly the importance one places on sustainability cues was the strongest predictor, a positive predictor for being in the action stage, and if this wasn't important to you at all uh, when you purchased wine, it, it predicted you um, say being in the pre-contemplation stage. So there's not much um, surprise there but um, but it was consistent across all behaviours. Um, wine involvement was important for several, several behaviours. So it positively predicted being in the action stage for when there's a choice, I choose those um, less environmentally harmful wines. If I understand the potential damage, I don't purchase the product. And also through the social and economic um, behaviours. If you have a high level of overall wine involvement, if you're into wine in general, you're more likely to be in the action stage for the sustainable wine uh, factors. Oh, interesting. So at one level, what's taste, what's taste got to do with anything in terms of um, sustainability? But both the importance of the taste um, or, or your anticipation of what a wine will taste like, but also how important quality is to you when you make a purchase. Both of these were predictive for, um, for some uh, of the sustainable wine behaviours. This quality theme comes up in, in other ways as well as data I haven't, haven't shown. And age, age crops up for three behaviours, but not in the direction that we would predict from what we saw earlier. Remember, those who are most uh, into sustainable wines self-reported tended to be younger. Yet when you actually break that down to specific behaviours, it's actually older people that are more likely to be engaged, at least in these three behaviours. So there's a mismatch between the two. Maybe it's simply aspirational. Younger people think that they should um, and report being more into sustainable wine, but they're not in terms of their behaviours. And that might be things like price barriers because sustainable wines are more, are more expensive. It's an interesting result. 
Right, the last question we asked was, what's the potential for moving, moving the dial? Is there much, should we be interested in promoting this, these products in our industry? I think the result that my conclusions from the submitted study are, are mixed, but mainly, yes, we should be. What argues against this is that we saw from that very first result that sustainability cues are not very important compared to other cues for local wine consumers at the moment. However, we just saw this slide. The vast majority of consumers are orange or yellow. They are in a change stage in terms of uh, their self-report that they do intend or do want to engage in these behaviours. That result, result alone, I think, should give us much confidence in, in moving forward. And most consumers indicate they are happy to pay more for an environmentally friendly and socially responsible wine. Well, that remains to be determined with actual um, behaviour, but they are reporting that they are, are unwilling to do so. We haven't got enough data uh, to comment on what the sweet spot is in terms of price sensitivity uh, and optimum pricing. Uh, that, as part of future work we would like to do. And the other piece of really good news for this question is that price aside, again, the, the jury is still out on that, that the most salient barriers to um, people adopting these behaviours uh, is actionable. It's knowledge. They're saying so themselves. <laughs> that we're, not, we're not quite sure. We're not quite sure what a sustainable wine is, but we're not quite sure on... Um, what are the cues that will tell me in a purchase environment that this wine is more sustainable than that wine? That's extremely actionable information. So that's an exciting result, I think. Right, conclusion, the summary. First of all, as we've alluded to several times, uh, sustainability cues are significantly less important than uh, almost everything else for consumers as a purchase motivator. The concept of what is a sustainable wine looks to be more fuzzy and less clear for wine consumers compared to what we know um, of consumers for other agri-food products. What we do know is the environmental dimensions are much more salient at the moment for, for wine consumers than the social or economic dimensions. And 22% of respondents uh, indicate they have no or very limited knowledge of, um, or understanding, I should say, of what a sustainable wine is. There are some characteristics that, that, that look clear in terms of those who are most engaged with this product. They're better educated, they're more wine involved generally, and they spend significantly more per bottle. Uh, as we've um, mentioned several times, uh, the vast majority of consumers are in a change state, a change stage when it comes to their intentions towards sustainable wine. Um, wine involvement consistently uh, is predictive of um, and, and, and strongly predictive of your sustainable wine behaviour. That's got implications for where and to whom we market um, these products to. And age and importance of both taste expectation and perceived quality also predict several sustainable wine uh, behaviours. So what, in terms of implications and recommendations, I think in the big picture, uh, this and related work suggests we need to get together uh, as, as an industry, um, or as, a, as a, a stakeholder community, and be generating uh, clear, integrated and consistent communication about both sustainability characteristics of our wines um, and also initiatives that help carry that message. We need to get our act together on the promotional educational front. It needs to be clear and consistent messaging. Certification, uh, a, a robust certification system is going to be important, but it's not going to be sufficient in my view, but, and that's important to, uh, to note. Certification, you know, the label on the bottle is going to help with that quick, easy um, cue for consumers to see, oh, this wine looks as if it's going to be more sustainable than that wine. But it needs to be concurrent uh, education um, and working out which are the key sustainability characteristics that you're more likely to pay money for. Is it, is it some vineyard practice? Is it a winery practice? Is it the social cues, the, how we treat migrant workers and so on? Now let's, let's work out what the pertinent cues are uh, to try and promote this behaviour. Got to be careful 
The market, and particularly the younger generation, are absolutely sick of greenwashing, so our initiatives have to be authentic, robust, auditable, and everything else. Um, I haven't shown all the data we have on this, so, so I don't believe it yet, um, but absolutely convinced that quality messaging is key. In fact, some work from, Europe, from European consumers would, would confirm this. On the whole, people are not going to buy consumable, sustainable wines unless they think the quality is the same or better than conventionally produced wine. Can't reinforce that enough. So your mess our messaging has to contain reassurances about the quality of the wine. It is key for sustainable wine, I think. Um, global standards, um, such as what the Sustainable Wine Roundtable are currently building, I think uh, will also help with that perceived integrity and certification system. And, and I'm told that um, uh, both Ontario and BC are working together to try and um, uh, form an integrated and common uh, certification, and maybe even logo uh, uh, system for designating sustainable wines, and that's fantastic. I think we've got some baseline data now for the average Canadian wine consumer that we can use to track uh, how engagement might change over time and how successful or not different um, interventions uh, might be. I also think from an academic perspective that the trans theoretical model is a really interesting way to, to capture the nuances of consumer behaviour uh, around wine. And further research. Um, dollars. I'm keen to do more work. Um, the Ontario Grape and Wine Research Inc. haven't been overly enthusiastic about um, a related projects in the past. Perhaps, it's, perhaps my projects are not enthusiastic about. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm going to make one last kick, one last kick at the can as part of um, um, in a, a, a large team collaboration. Uh, uh, involving uh, many Cubby researchers, uh, University of British Columbia, several universities and research groups across the country um, have all formed a consortium and just put in an application to uh, a new fund called, uh, called Alliance, uh, geared around net zero wine. Uh, and a small part of that project that I um, uh, am leading, if, if it gets funded, is around consumer perceptions of, uh, of low carbon wine and very excited to be partnering with Ontario Craft Wineries and Stratus as two partners who are going to support this work uh, if it gets funded. Uh, and again, I'm just relating, talking about the consumer part of this project. Um, we'll do more work with consumer perceptions. Surveys are limited. We'll be doing focus groups and using other methods to dive much deeper into what the attitudes and barriers are for consumer adoption of these wines. And in particular, we'll focus a lot on, on messaging. Um, what's the optimum way to, to message, be it wine labels, be it um, social media posts, be it articles, whatever. What's the best way to message, to frame information about sustainability, to engage the consumer? And in particular, we're going to use some economic models to, to, uh, to go up and question, where is that sweet spot in terms of pricing? What can the market bear? And what are the characteristics of, different se uh, of the different segments in the marketplace in terms of the premium that we can extract from sustainable wines? So, very excited about that, that, that possibility. Don't believe anything you hear on this podium unless it's been through the peer review process or something similar. Um, most of what I've told you is likely kosher, but it's just been published in these, these two journals. I've got copies if you are interested at all and, and follow up in more detail. More than happy to uh, to send you copies.
If your motivation as a, as a wine producer is to do, do the, the right thing in terms of being more sustainable, um, then there's no need to, that's the only motivation, why, why promote or advertise it? Other than to perhaps for it to be an example or a model for other uh, industry members. But most of us can't afford that, or if we see an opportunity for a premium or, or to simply um, um, make up the added costs of being truly sustainable, then we need consumers to be on board and likely to be paying a premium for that. So uh, I think it comes down to what the main motivators are for that winery and adopting um, more uh, greener practices. There's one interesting, you know, um, thorny thing from that answer, and that may explain why some wineries, I say wineries, I'm talking about vineyards too, the whole process, uh, are somewhat reluctant to advertise their practices. And that's inferred by that quality result that I showed you, that I don't think every producer is confident that sustainability is, uh, sustainably produced wines are seen by many consumers as being of equal quality. Um, We've given some examples of other wine styles, but I'll get into trouble. So uh, there might be a reluctance uh, on this particular, and they may be they may be correct in their in their, their concerns that if I market this whole hog as being made from sustainable grapes, sustainable techniques, um, there might be an implied um, uh, um, association with a lower quality product because perhaps the, the mere absence of information is saying. This tastes like peach and dog and whatever, whatever other ways we confer quality on our labels. You know, almost by definition it's missing because we need space to promote the sustainability um, dimensions. So um, I'm not sure how much of that is, uh, is, is a driver. Um, but I suspect for most producers um, are, are not economically in a situation where they can, um, uh, they can afford just to do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing that they need consumer buy-in and absolutely that we've got to promote that. I, I think it's not just an individual producer issue, it's very much an industry-wide uh, initiative uh, if we're going to get it right. Any questions? Here I have a question. Um, you prepped a little outside of, of what you presented today, but maybe the, the next step in converting you know, consumers to more sustainable wines. You mentioned in your, your talk the least sustainable packaging is glass wine bottles, right, for a, a number of different reasons. If wineries, you know, could prove equal quality in a, you know, in a, another kind of packaging, what sort of barriers, given all those factors that, that you presented today, would there be to the consumer, you know, to switch to, you know, Tetra pack yeah. version of wine versus, you know, in in the wine bottle, um, knowing that that second packaging is is leading to more sustainable production, gotcha. you know, overall. And it would it. And the second part of this is, would it take like an industry leader to make that jump, you know, that consumers are going to buy that wine no matter what packaging it's in you know, for, for other consumers and other producers to then follow. Great, great questions. Um, I'll, and I'll probably forget most of them, so don't do that. Um, uh, on that first one, um, I think it's extremely well established, it's well established that there is huge, still huge consumer pushback on alternative packaging to glass due to perceived inferior product. I mean, that's just a, a truism. We've been quite slow, I think, in, in Canada in changing consumer attitudes around this, but it's, it's still it's not true, true for all demographics, but it's still true. And giving something other than a glass bottle, I find myself doing this. It's like, you know, it's a bit dodgy, what's the quality going to be like? So we're fighting against that as a, as a, as a, as a current uh, barrier. Kind of like, sorry, just uh, kind of like um, screw uh, cork and screw pack. Exactly, and I was going to use that example to answer the second question. Um, the, the, other, the other part of that is, um, is the current consumer perception around glass. So there'll be a pushback because, well, it's not glass, so um, dodgy character, dodgy quality. But currently consumers think glass is the bee's knees in terms of wine packaging, in terms of being environmentally friendly. Right. Okay. 
And it ain't. It really isn't. And there's so many papers out there. One came out last week from um, AWRI in Australia you know, quantifying the greenhouse gas emissions from the typical glass bottle. We're doing great things in, in, in Ontario. The RCBO with its, its light bottle program has been a world leader. So we're doing good things, but um, we're not reusing bottles, for instance, would make a huge difference. Italy's doing some, pro some primary work now at the logistics of um, reusing bottles, quite a slightly recycling. And there's some cool stuff happening. But at the moment, you're fighting against consumer perception that anything other than glass is going to be an environmentally you know, dodgy uh, thing. And the industry leader, the, the first past the post idea, yeah, I think we saw that with uh, best examples in Australia with the adoption you know, of, of screw caps as alternative closures. Massive pessimism and, and, um, and pushback at the start, and yet now it's the norm in so much of the, um, of the Western, of the New World anyway. Uh, and all the evidence says there are no quality concerns now. Yeah. Good questions. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, please join me in, in thanking Gary uh, for a great time. <laughs> small portion of our appreciation, Gary. And uh, just a reminder that next week we'll welcome Dr. Viet Basur, who's a professor of biological and environmental sciences here at Brock. And her lecture will explore the science surrounding cover crops and vineyards and whether commercial, native, exotic, or none at all is the best path forward uh, for cover crops. So we look forward to seeing you all uh, next week, same place, same time. Thanks. <laughs>